Welcome to the Ministry of the Word at Believer's Chapel. It is great to be with you this morning and to see so many of you here uh, with us. It's interesting, so I thought, you know, we weren't wearing the mask up here because we just had beautiful singing voices and it would be a crime to cover them up, but evidently it's because we're just 20 feet away, but anyways, you get to hear our beautiful voices unmuffled. Well, we do have a few announcements this week. Of course, uh, this Tuesday, uh, the women's prayer meeting will uh, commence in person as well as on Thursday. So there's two. So ladies, mark your calendar for those. Wednesday night, we will have the Peculiar People class at 7, the Youth Midweek Recharge, and then Footsteps. So those classes began uh, this last Wednesday. It was great to see so many people here. I know the children had a wonderful time, and it was a little bit of a return to normalcy and, and great to have those classes meeting in person uh, as we continue even this morning to increase the attendance and appreciate everybody uh, taking the steps to register online uh, if you're coming and uh, we're just grateful to have so many here with us. Well, we do have a few prayer requests this morning. Of course, I think I saw David Neal this morning, so he has recovered, so that's a great praise. Uh, if you see him, uh, tell him hello. And now, Mark will come forward and read our scripture reading for this morning. Mark. Thank you, Seth. Good morning, everybody. I think it'd be good to acknowledge that not everybody thinks the same way about all these precautions uh, with the coronavirus. And... um, That's understandable, and uh, so I want to thank you for uh, indulging the decisions that have been made. They haven't been uh, made thoughtlessly by any means, uh, but with a lot of thought and prayer. And so, uh, but there's been no rancor or anything like that. So uh, the Saints of Believers Chapel, thank you so much. Thank you for the leadership, and I'm not talking about me and all the elders necessarily, but all the leaders who have participated in making those decisions. And hopefully soon uh, we'll be back uh, with our regular routine, uh, sitting side by side with each other. And Seth can go back to doing the announcements at the 8.30. (laughs) Amen. No, actually, he's, he's gained a permanent position uh, <laughs> greeting and, and doing the announcements. But, uh, so thank you. Many, many thanks, and we've thanked all the tech team. And uh, my thoughts uh, of this will always go back to uh, the first Sunday when Dan was up here all by himself. <laughs> there was nobody uh, in this room. And then I got to come and sit over there. So And Seth was here eventually, and then we're... Two people and the tech team, So, but uh, Dan's been a stalwart uh, standing in this pulpit every Sunday, and we've all enjoyed that. And I thank him for letting me fill in for him this morning. And we are in uh, Psalm 8, so please open your Bibles to Psalm 8. I haven't been up here in a while, Jeff, to this light. Oh well, I can do without it. Psalm 8 is one of my personal favorites, so we got to sing one of my favorite hymns, thank you, Uh, and now read one of my favorite psalms. It is a simple psalm in one sense in that it portrays the psalmist David reflecting on the universe and its marvelous display of the majesty of the Lord, and then pondering how small and fragile man's place in it is. And that's an exercise in feeling common, I think, to all of us. And yet the psalm is complex in that in the very exercise of asking the question that he does, what is man that you take thought of him? He penetrates to the very deepest truths. Students of the psalm have labeled it a creation hymn or a creation psalm. And what the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 teaches and what David seems to have had good access 
uh, 2, uh, is that man is the crown of God's creation. Uh, mankind is often despaired of that thought uh, because of our frailties and the many miseries that have plagued our history, disease, uh, war, untold sufferings. So his question is one still on the minds of many people today. But David was not immune to the reality of human weakness and suffering, and still under divine inspiration, he wrote this psalm ascribing not only glory to God for his creation, but also supreme dignity to man for how God has established his place in his creation, man-made in the image of God. Well, let's read the psalm, Psalm 8, it's a short psalm. For the choir director on the Gittith, we don't know what that is, some kind of instrument probably, a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth, who have displayed your splendor above the heavens. From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? And that little phrase, take thought, uh, has the sense of not forgotten but remembered. And you may see that, some of you, in your translation, some of you in the margin of your Bibles. But what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. And I should say something about that verse as well, because some of your translations have, uh, you've made him lower than the angels. And it's the word Elohim, that's the most common word for God in our Hebrew Bibles, and it almost always means God, uh, but some have been uncomfortable with the idea that the psalmist would, would say this, uh, that you've made man a little lower than God, and so they've opted for the alternative translation of, of angelic beings, of, of, of messengers, of angels. The translators of the Greek uh, Old Testament, the Septuagint, chose that. They put the word for angels there. And uh, the author of Hebrews, who we're going to be referring to later in the message, uh, uh, used that word in his commentary on the passage. Some of you have the NIV, and I believe that has uh, angels as well. But here's the statement. I believe he's talking about God. And that's the correct translation. You have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea. Whatever passes through the paths of the seas, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. May the Lord bless this reading of his word, and will you join me in a word of prayer? Not everybody has an Elizabeth <clears throat> come up with a song that matches the, the text, so thank you to her for that. The subject of our message this morning is our majestic Lord and the dignity of man. Psalm 8 is a psalm of praise to God, and the occasion of the psalmist's praise is his contemplation that the God whose glory the heavens reflect has also glorified himself in the earth, and especially and unexpectedly in the creation of man. That is the primary thought, the surprising dignity of man. But also, somewhat hidden in this old covenant psalm is the decay of man that calls forth a savior. And so it is the New Testament that gives us the fuller interpretation of David's musings. 
The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 2 testifies to a destiny for man that far surpasses this mortal experience. He refers to a world to come that God has not subjected to angels, meaning he has not left it to angels to ensure that it comes. Uh, later, he writes of one who has come to the aid of mortal man. But in between, he describes the God-man, Jesus, who came to be forevermore all that God ever intended man, Adam, Adam, to be, and who by his person and work has inaugurated this world to come and come to man's aid as no other could. We'll come back to Hebrews 2 at the end of our study today. Uh, but you can readily see that between the psalm and what we know about the human experience and what the author of Hebrews writes, God's creation of man installed a dignity ending in decay, but for whom nevertheless there is a great destiny. So man is the main topic of the psalmist, but the psalm is bookended in the first and last verse, by matching expressions of the majesty of God. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We will never be able to understand our dignity unless we have first recognized the relationship between that dignity and the existence of a God of all excellence who has created us and placed us where we are. And David recognizes that, and he adds to his own expression of praise that of the covenant nation of which he is king. It is, O Lord, our Lord, Yahweh Adonai. Uh, this is Yahweh, he speaks of, the great I Am, who had revealed himself to the nation through Moses in the burning bush and identified himself as the covenant-keeping God of Israel, the God of your fathers, he had said, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Man can only understand his significance as he sees it in relation to the one true God who has vested him with that significance. But even if unrecognized by some, that does not mean that God is not still majestic. His name is, is majestic in all the earth, uh, even if he is not universally proclaimed as such, for he has yet made himself known in that way. And that was what the Apostle Paul emphasized in the first chapter of Romans, that all men know God, even though they may not recognize him as God or give thanks to him. Their response reflects not on God, but on them but that he would be majestic on the earth is no surprise to David, seeing as how the Lord is constantly displaying his glory above the heavens, he says. Uh, David's son, Solomon, would later express a sim similar thought when dedicating the temple in 1 Kings 8, exclaiming, Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built for you. So here David marvels that Yahweh Adonai has displayed his splendor above the heavens and his majestic name upon the earth. The prophet Isaiah would later hear an echo of that sentiment from the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Splendor and majesty then are words rightly attributed to the covenant God of Israel. Consequently, we're somewhat startled to see opposition in verse 2. Uh, yet so great, in fact, is our Lord that these sudden adversaries, and they're always there, aren't they? They're increasingly arrayed against him today, his adversaries are forced to cease their hostility at the word of the absolute weakest of mankind, infants and nursing babes. 
From the mouth of infants and nursing babes, you have established strength because of your adversaries to make the enemy and the revengeful cease. That, that means something like establishing a fortress against the enemy. And their mouth, and this is poetic language, remember, is a metonymy for their voice of petitions and, and praise. In the context of the psalm, it's an apt metaphor for David's nation, a tiny in size and surrounded by hostile nations stronger than it, and yet paradoxically empowered by God to be his defender. Uh, likewise for us, in the church, I want you to think about this. It symbolizes the strength that is ours. Uh, though it seems the whole world is rising against us and against our God to, be, to bear witness to God's truth and to be his defender. But this is the running theme of the Bible, if you think about it, this picture of the best and the brightest, the wittiest and the cocksure, daring to speak out in opposition to the majestic God while those who would follow after him and identify with him feel overwhelmingly helpless in the face of their assaults. But all along, the Lord himself sits in the heavens laughing, Psalm 2, laughing, content to let the weak, the foolish, the nobodies of the world stand in his defense. It was illustrated perfectly in the life of Jesus. You'll recall this scene in Matthew 21 in his triumphant entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He entered not on a great stallion, but on the foal of a donkey. And as he made his way to the temple, his enemies, the chief priests and the scribes were especially irked about the children shouting in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. You can just hear the children, Hosanna to the son of David. And they demanded of him, do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus' only response to them was, yes. Have you never read? And then he basically shoved this psalm in their face out of the mouths of infants and nursing babes, you've prepared praise for yourself. So the message of the first part of the psalm is this. God is so great, uh, so majestic in both heaven and earth, he requires no defense greater than the very weakest that can be found. He has let the defense of his honor be committed to babes. But the bulk of the psalm is about man, and so in verse 3, David turns his attention to his own world and wonders, in the light of the majesty of God and the vast creation, why he would take note of man. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that, which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him and the son of man that you care for him? On those rare occasions when we're able to get just the slightest glimpse of the massive expanse of God's creation, we inevitably feel our puniness before it and cannot help but feel an overpowering sense of how insignificant we must be in the scope of things. It's a challenge to get a good look at the night sky anymore as David was able to. He grew up a shepherd and spent countless nights out in the field. And there, as he lay himself down, he was treated to the visual spectacle of the heavens, breathtaking in its reach. The moon, the stars, the planets revolving in their paths, night after night, season after season in the clear eastern atmosphere. And David understood by faith, as the author of Hebrews put it, that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, or as he puts it here poetically, by the work of his fingers, a slick anthropomorphism aimed at underscoring the facility with which 
God created such a, a brilliant expanse. It would take the shepherd David's breath away to ponder how God had created it all with the ease with which perhaps an experienced card player's fingers effortlessly shuffles his cards. James Boyce told a story about William Beebe and Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Beebe was a, a biologist and an explorer who was also a personal friend of the president. He used to visit him at Sagamore Hill, uh, his home on Long Island, and he told of a game the two used to play. After an evening of conversation, they would go outside onto the lawn surrounding the great house and, and search the sky until they found the faint spot of light beyond the lower left corner of the great square of Pegasus. And one of them would recite to the other, that is the spiral galaxy in Andromeda. It is as large as the Milky Way. It is one of a hundred million galaxies. It consists of 100 billion suns, each larger than our sun. And then Roosevelt would grin at Beebe and say, now I think we're small enough. We can go to bed. Well, as I say, in our populous world, we rarely have that opportunity to feel the enormity of the heavens. Uh, trapped inside our bodies and our own consciousness, we tend to think of ourselves as important, but for all the wrong reasons. But perhaps uh, with the luxury of a backcountry wilderness experience or an ocean cruise, we may enjoy such a thing as David enjoyed. And in those providential moments, Peeking into the vastness of God's creation, we are silenced by such pretensions and, and feel our weakness instead, as David did, blurt, blurting out with stately wonder, what is man that you take thought of him, that you care for him? Even the word he chose to express himself, man, was not the familiar Hebrew word for man, Adam, but rather intentionally Enosh, man in his weakness, a mere mortal. The inestimable difference between God and man impresses with the force when confronted with such a celestial display as David was privileged to experience. It's as if he could only shake his head and admit, I am an ant, I am a, a gnat, I am a wisp of wind, surely in the mind of my creator. That's his first thought, but then it's swallowed up in another. God has taken thought of man, he cares for him. Uh, not only has this awesome creator, God kept feeble man in his thoughts, remembering him, which you know is always the biblical expression of love, uh, moving towards the object of his memory to action. He, he cares for them. He tends to them. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. As he told Noah, while the earth remains, Seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. Great is thy faithfulness. And so David marvels at man's unexpected significance before God, developing the thought in, in verse 5, yet you've made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You Make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. This is the creation mandate of Genesis chapters 1 and 2. David was thoroughly familiar with Moses' account. And now the very words of the 
Genesis account, uh, leap off the page, uh, 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 so to speak, to suggest themselves to him. But how could David consider that the Creator had made man just a little lower than God? It's easy to see how some have thought that surely he had in mind only the angelic beings. They are superior to man in some respects, not bound by gravity, it seems, as we read about them in the Bible, possessing powers at times beyond mere men, and appearing in the scriptures as closely connected to God. But seeing as how David has in mind, in his mind, Genesis 1, where not only is Elohim the prominent term used of God there, but he is seen as creating man in distinction from all the other created images in, the, in his own image, it flows naturally to what position man has in relation to God. On top of that, as David notes here, God made him king over the created world. He crowned him with glory and majesty and made him to rule. Now, this is what the creation mandate entailed. He put all things under his feet. And then he enumerates his subjects in progressive order and using the very words of Genesis 1, beginning, notice, with the domestic animals, but ex extending to those more and more seemingly not under his control, the sheep and oxen first, uh, the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea, and more, whatever passes through the paths of the seas. This is mankind's mandate to ex exercise sovereignty over the earth and all it contains, to subdue it, making it useful for the benefit of mankind and for the glory of God. Now that implies uh, many things which would be more aptly discussed in a study of the Genesis passage itself, but what it surely encompasses is stewardship of the earth and its resources and not reckless destruction and disregard for those who will come after us. It would imply the kind of benevolent lordship over animals, which reflects the kindness and nurturing that God himself exercises over his creatures. And yet it is clear that these created things are to serve man and not the reverse, it is man whom God has crowned and for whom he has created all things. It is man made in the image of God. One of the commentators uh, notes an interesting thing here. It's that David chose to identify man in his position relative to God and not to the animals because he could have written, think about it, that. God made him a little higher than the beasts instead of a little lower than God. The reason it does not say that, though men and women have been given a position midway between the heavenly beings and the beasts, is that it is nevertheless humanity's special privilege and duty to look upward to God in whose image we have been made rather than downward to the beasts. The result is that they become increasingly more like God uh, rather than increasingly beast-like in our behavior. But the sad reality of history, and especially modern times, is men and women have turned their backs on God, and since they will no longer look up to God, which again is their privilege and duty they choose instead, to look downward to the beasts and become increasingly like them. And so as our society has removed God and his glory from their field of interest and followed after their own exclusively human designs, even beastly designs, the consequence is the behavior that we see, which is no better than that of the beasts of the earth and, and sometimes worse. 
man's dignity has been obscured. And you know, that reality uh, cedes to every Christian man and woman the obligation and the sacred responsibility to restore its luster. By the power of the Holy Spirit, we must endeavor to be who God intended us to be and exhibit a distinct differentiation in our thought and conduct so that we appear more like Jesus Christ and not the world. David, here in our psalm, has in mind man as God intended him to be. And so he concludes his psalm in verse 9 with a repeat of his initial doxology, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so now it's obvious that David's intent was not primarily to focus on the dignity of man, but rather on his dignity as expressing a remarkable demonstration of the greatness of our Lord. In both heaven and earth, our creator God, our covenant-keeping God displays his majesty. And how overwhelming is the thought to the shepherd king, David, that such a God had invested such dignity in man. So that's the psalm. But now, here we are today, some 3,000 years after David recorded his musings, and we look around... Uh, We look at man and ask the same question David did. What is man? Uh, Where is his dignity? We don't see dignity, but decay instead. Here is man in mindless pursuits. Here is man with great wealth and affluence, greater than was ever thought possible allowing more and more time to be spent on self-pleasure, materialism, and and perversions. Everywhere there is selfishness and greed, envy, and vitriol. And that's just on the presidential campaign trail. (laughs) Everywhere, every day, The world of man is full of hatred, murder, and deceit. I don't even need to rattle off the list of atrocities that we have witnessed in the past year. They're seared in our minds. It's really the history of man. One war after another, one genocide after another, one cruel rule of oppression after another, senseless Anarchy, where there is not authoritarian suppression of rights. And every issue, doesn't matter what it is, yields opposing alignments and protests with mindless violence. This Edenic picture of man made just a little lower than God and crowned with glory and majesty. Where is it? Where is it? Well, you know where it is because you know the scriptures. You read the scriptures. The answer is given to us by the authors of the New Testament. Uh, The author of Hebrews especially, but also the Apostle Paul. There is something better, but it's not simply man restored or man reformed. We hear a lot about that. It's really quite amazing. The authors of the New Testament studied the same psalm we have before us uh, this morning. And their conclusion is our conclusion. It is man, but the God-man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, the incarnation of the second person of the triune God explains it. That was clear to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, that great chapter about the resurrection of Christ in the section beginning about verse 20 and following where he draws the comparison between Adam in whom all died and the second Adam in whom 
there is life, he speaks of Christ as the first fruits, and then of those who belong to Christ, who will enjoy that fullness of life when he comes again to reign. And there he points, Paul does, there he points to the fulfillment of our psalm, a, a king who will reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And that, Paul says, will be the fulfillment of Psalm 8, verse 6. He has put all things in subjection under his feet. Those words were true, in a sense, in man originally, but they are, in their highest sense, only true of Christ as the great head of mankind, and of man only in him. It is Christ who has fulfilled the creation mandate as our representative. He became for us what we proved unable to become ourselves. But it is the passage in Hebrews chapter 2 that makes the clearest connection with David's psalm. You might want to turn to Hebrews chapter 2 if you have your Bibles. And you recall the context perhaps of those first chapters in the epistle to the Hebrews. The author is making the case that Jesus, as God's own son, is better than any previous minister he has sent. And in chapter 2, particularly, that he's better than the angels. And so we read in Hebrews 2, verse 5, For he did not subject to angels the world to come concerning which we are speaking, but one has testified somewhere saying, What is man that you remember him, or the son of man that you are concerned about him? You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in subjecting all things to him, he left nothing that is not subject to him. But now we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Now we do not yet see all things subjected to man. There's over there uh, what God promised. But now, uh, over here, the, the current reality, thorns and thistles and sweat and death. The author of Hebrews, like us, looks around and sees. Uh, that's not what it looks like. It does not look like what David was extolling. G.K. Chesterton wrote, whatever else may be said of man, this one thing is clear. He is not what he is capable of being. But here's what God did. He intervened in history. Centuries after David wrote, there were some other shepherds out in the same fields near Bethlehem, keeping watch over their flocks by night. Perhaps the night sky was as bright with stars then as it was on those nights that David recalled. But a brighter glory than the stars suddenly shone around them, the glory of the Lord, and with the glory, an angelic messenger. Do not be afraid, he said. Today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Man needed a Savior to restore his dignity, to reverse the decay, and ensure his destiny. Uh, the great idea and purpose of his creation had not been fulfilled until now. But now the Savior had come to give man the aid no other could and bring in the promised world to come. I don't think we can really appreciate the majesty of the man, Jesus Christ, until we truly understand the depth of the tragedy wrapped up in these words that we're reading this morning, we do not yet see all things subjected to him. Things are not as they ought to be. And so the author of Hebrews lends us this wondrous assertion in verse 9. But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. We do see Jesus. Everything that man was made to be, everything that was intended for us, all the glory and honor that was meant for us but was lost in Adam and his sin is recovered in the last Adam, the God-man, Jesus Christ, who humbled himself to take on a human nature like ours to forever become our brother in order that he might give himself for us as our great high priest, the sacrifice for our sins that brought us near again to God. Who is like the Lord our God, asked the psalmist in Psalm 113. Who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth, he raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. You see, it's not just how far above he is. It is how far down he comes to bless. Some preacher once said, the Lord Jesus betrothed himself to the human race for better or worse. The second person of the Trinity married himself to the human race forever. And in that act of humble condescension, he raised man back up with him and gave him, gifted to him, his own victor's crown. When on September 2nd, 1945, General Douglas MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz and the other Allied generals met their vanquished Japanese foes on the USS Missouri, MacArthur began the ceremony with these words. We're gathered here, representatives of the major warring powers, to conclude a solemn agreement whereby peace may be restored. The issues involving divergent ideals and ideologies have been determined on the battlefields of the world and hence are not for our discussion or debate. The war was over. The issues had been determined. Christ fought our war for us. The battlefield was his incarnation as our representative ending in the cross. Our issues as sinful men and women were determined there by him. The author of Hebrews will go on to say that in Christ, God is bringing many sons to glory. It is a glory we lost through sin, but that has been recovered in the Son of God. And so we may repeat this morning the psalmist David's wondrous exclamation, O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The majesty of the Lord revealed now in the dignity of man. So we might well ask today, what is man? And I will tell you, and you'll say amen, we are great. <laughs> we have great significance. But our dignity, our significance, is to be found only in Christ. Everything else is vanity. This is how men and women are blessed by worshiping and obeying the one true God in his one true son, the man, Jesus Christ. And the role of the church is to be that clear voice proclaiming the truth and not compromising, uh, pointing our society to Jesus Christ as the only hope for peace, a, a well-being that will last and for relationships with peoples that so far as it depends on us, are grounded in mutual understanding of our own sinful state, of how short we fall of the image of God, and our mutual need of the one perfect man, Jesus Christ. 
We do see him. Do you see him? Do you see Jesus and know him as your God and Savior? If you're burdened with sin and with a spiritual awareness that you are not who you were intended to be, you can have your sins forgiven, your dignity as a person made in the image of God restored simply by believing this word of truth that Jesus tasted death for all who believe in him. He bore the penalty for sin so that we might live a royal and glorious life. If you never trusted in Christ, take that step of faith today and believe in him and receive forgiveness and eternal life. That is our prayer for you, uh, that the Lord will open your heart to do that today. Shall we close in prayer? Father, uh, what a glorious passage of scripture this is uh, to think that you have remembered us, you have tended to us, you have cared uh, for us. Uh, what a glorious thought that is. Thank you for Jesus, uh, the perfect man. We ponder the depths of his humiliation and we realize what true majesty is. And Father, I pray that uh, we might be uh, always endeavoring to elevate uh, our conduct, to elevate our thought, uh, to elevate uh, our aspirations to coincide with yours through your Son, the Lord Jesus. We pray in his name. And Father, we pray uh, as we are about to partake of the Lord's Supper that you would give blessing, that you would point us uh, to him in the way that he has set forth for us. It's in his name we pray. Amen. We want to welcome you to this uh, Lord's Supper service today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26, the Apostle Paul gives the church a description of the first Lord's Supper, which is the pattern we follow today. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper contains a reference to the past, to the present, and to the future. For the past, it is a memorial of one person and one fact in that person's life. For the present, it is the symbol of the Christian life. And for the future, it is a prophecy, since by observing the Lord's Supper, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. These three aspects of the ordinance help us understand the significance of the Lord's Supper. First, we think of the Lord's Supper as a memorial of the past. The real meaning of the words, do this in remembrance of me, is do this in case you forget. Do this in order that you may recall to memory the sacrificial death of Christ on the cross for you. The language in the form of the Lord's Supper, its connection with the ancient Passover, and its connection with the new covenant, all point to the significance of Christ's death as a sacrifice for sin. It is signified in the body and the blood separately remembered as a sacrifice, it is seen in the words, the body broken for you, and the blood shed for many for the remission of sins. It is seen in the association with the Passover sacrifice. Christ's declaration that this is the blood of the new covenant means one thing. His death is the foundation of the saving relationship with God for those who believe that Christ's sacrificial death 
accomplished the forgiveness of their sins. This is the point that Christ desires for us to remember and that we would also have grateful hearts for his gracious gift to us. The memorial ordinance of the Lord's Supper is also a symbol for the present. The Christ who died is the Christ who lives and must be the focus of the believer's life. The Christian life is not merely the remembrance of a historical Christ in the past, but it is the present participation in a living Christ with us now. The true life of the believer is the finding, is the feeding of our souls upon him, our minds meditating upon his truths which are in Christ, our hearts feeding upon his love for us, our wills guided by his word, our hopes feeding upon him who is our hope, and our whole nature finding, finding its nourishment in Christ Jesus. We remember that this fellowship is possible only to those who approach him through his death. We must nourish our spirits on the truth that he was crucified for our acceptance with God. As stated in John 6, verse 54, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Finally, the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, which is a memorial and a symbol, is also a prophecy. The Apostle Paul emphasizes the prophetic aspect of the ordinance by the words, until he comes. The ordinance is the prophecy of a time when the need for it shall cease. The first Lord's Supper in the upper room was a prophecy of Christ's table in his kingdom. Heaven is to be a feast. That heavenly feast surpasses the symbols of the upper room. The future there, in the future there, there will be no more sorrow and struggle, but we shall feast on Christ. Through eternity, the glorified Christ will be the bread of our spirits and his past sacrifice, the foundation of our eternal hopes. Do this in remembrance of me. May our participation in this Lord's Supper today be a memorial of his death, a symbol of our life in him, and a prophecy of the heavenly, of heaven that awaits all of us who believe on him. Let me give thanks for the bread. Dear Father, we thank you for sending your Son, the Lord Jesus, who redeemed us by his perfect sacrifice. We thank you that we have the opportunity to remember his death for the salvation of our souls. Help us to live today as faithful believers in him and to look forward to the eternal life that he has secured for us. We also thank you now for the grace given to us to believe in him and all that he has accomplished on the cross. And now we ask that you bless us as we partake of the bread, which is the symbol of the body of the Lord Jesus, broken to save his people from their sins. In Christ's name, amen. I'm going to read the, much of the balance of at Hebrews chapter 2 a passage, picking up with where we left off. It's just a few verses. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. For be both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And then picking it up with verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. For assuredly, he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendant of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become a merciful 
and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Uh, these elements represent the high priestly work of the second Adam, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark has already uh, mentioned that. He is our great high priest, uh, his body given for us, uh, his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. He took the cup, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And by shedding that blood, he made propitiation, a, a word that has been a theme of our COVID observations of the Lord's Supper. He satisfied the holy wrath of God against our sin by bearing it in himself. And for that, uh, we give thanks. Father, thank you for this cup, which is a reminder of uh, that work of propitiation. The Lord accomplished on our behalf at great cost. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me as you turned from him and, and laid our sin upon his shoulders and he bore the penalty. We rejoice in that and give you thanks. In his name, amen. Well, Dan should be back next Sunday. Uh, Dan, look forward to seeing you next Sunday. Uh, hope you have a great week. Let me pronounce this blessing. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.